Grace is the way in which God interacts with the world. When God does something, it's, uh, it's an act of grace. Uh, because God is loving us and God's interacting with us. God's trying to protect those who are trying to be faithful. Um, and as we then dig into the Bible, one of the things that I'm looking for many times is an experience of God's grace. You know, Lord, would you speak to me? Lord, would you interact with me in some way, shape, or form? And so today, as we start looking at the book of Ephesians, um, that's what we're doing. At the same time, I understand that, you know, sometimes folks, when they think about what we do as a church, I mean, they may say, well, why would we even do that? You know, um, we're transitioning from the sermon series on expectations into a new sermon series. And if that breaks your heart, well, you should have expected I would go from one series to the next, right? You knew that was coming. You knew it was. We ended talking about our expectations of the church. What do we expect of a church? What do we expect? And now we're going into a book of the Bible that talks a lot about uh, the way in which the church should operate and the way that we as the people of God that are just called the church, universal around the world, people following God through Jesus in order to church, what should that look like? And uh, as I look about at this, I realize, well, wait a second. Um, people may be saying, well, why, why even talk about the Bible? Why, why even do that? And I would say, well, why even go to church? Why get together to talk about anything? Why have a small group? Why have a Sunday school class? Why have a worship service at all? Like, you know, because that means that you've got to go be around people. And I don't know, people sometimes are not the best to be around. I mean, have you ever thought, I just, I don't want to be around people. You know, it reminds me of this comedian named Louis Black, who would be like, I don't want to be around people. I want to be around dogs. You know, he's like you know, talking about that. And I bet some of you are like that. You know, you're like, sometimes being around people are, you know, if you think about it, the number of times you've been hurt in life, emotionally hurt, deeply, how many times was it a person's fault? <laughs> like rocks don't hurt us, you know, I'm like, go be around trees, right? You know, yeah, I you know that's not too, not too emotionally scarring, but being around people that can be difficult. And yet, in the Bible, we keep hearing again and again and again this call to be together, and we need each other, and we need to love each other, and that's a part of being together as God's people. So why be an Ephesians church? Well, interestingly enough, like the answer, because God said so, is kind of where we're going with this. In the book of Ephesians, we're going to find some things that part of the way I look at it is, it's almost like the serenity prayer. Ephesians helps us to have the serenity to accept the things that we can't change. They're just the way they are, it's the way God wants them to be. We've got to accept some things that we can't change. We've got to be willing to change and accept God's help to change the things that can change. And we need the wisdom to know the difference. Because otherwise, we're beating our heads up against the wall. There are certain things that we just have to accept are the case. If we ignore them and we live as though they're not the case, it doesn't change the fact that they are the case. If I say, I'm going to eat a dozen donuts a day, I'm going to follow that with 24 cans of beer a day. I'm going to follow that with three packs, packs of cigarettes a day. And then I'm going to assume that because my heart rate is now going crazy and, and going fast, that's basically the same as exercise. So I'm basically exercising every day, right? You know? I can believe that all I want. I can say that all I want. That does not make it so, right? It's not going to change the reality, which is that's not a good idea. You know, if, if, if I got really mad at my dad, and I'm like, Harold Custer is not my dad, you know, and I think about, you know, somebody else, Stephen Curry's my dad, and I start telling everybody that, you know, they're going to think I'm an idiot, right? Because there's a reality. No, Harold is my dad. <coughs> Stephen Curry would be a great dad. I'm probably older than him. Actually, I know I am. So that'd be really awkward, right? <laughs> I am my dad's dad. I don't know. I don't know. You just get the idea. There are things that you can't change. In the book of Ephesians, when we dive into it, we're going to find that as Paul was writing this letter 2,000 years ago, when you grab your Bible, you know, certain parts of it, I mean, you're not going to find anything that was written newer than almost 2,000 years ago. It's like, well, why do I even care about that? Well, because as Christians that follow Jesus have read this particular book again and again, even though it's not written to us, there are things that God would kind of put on Christians' hearts to say, that applies like to everybody. 
This other part maybe is just for them. Another part is like for everybody. And then sometimes when we read it, God can put on our hearts, this is for you. This is for you right now, today. God's using that somehow to communicate to us. I pray that'll be the case for you as we look at just 14 verses. We're going to read the whole book over the coming weeks, but today we're just starting at the very beginning. We call it a book because it's in the Bible as a book of the Bible, but it's a letter. We're reading this mail from Paul to the church, the people that believe in Jesus in Ephesus. Here we go. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Uh, this is a weird way to write, but it was very common back then. This is kind of the style that you would write in. Here we go. To God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, again we're thinking in Jesus Christ, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when the times had reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under who? Christ. In him, you get this theme, right? In him, in Christ, in him, in Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. I know that's a little different than the way we would typically write an email or write a letter, but even if you're not used to the Bible, you probably noticed that the main subject throughout this whole beginning of the letter, even though it's a letter to the Ephesians, the Ephesians are like secondary. God is kind of the main subject. Did you pick that up? So you've got God and you've got God's Son, Jesus Christ, and again and again and again, including in that very last part there, for God's possession. God possesses us. God wants to have us for God's self. So I bet you figured it out, you know, the very beginning of the, the bulletin, the very front, you know, we are in God's story. Now that's one of those things that we cannot change. Okay? I can, I can try to disbelieve in God, but that doesn't change the reality declared here that God exists and that I exist only because God decided I should exist. Like there wasn't some way that I negotiated with the Lord for me to now come into existence because there wasn't a Nathan and then there was Nathan. God decided Nathan should exist. You are here living because God wants you here living. Now, since God is revealing God's self in the New Testament as incredibly loving, giving us even Jesus himself to pay for any penalty that you deserve, we know then that if God wants us to exist, that's pretty awesome. God loves you. God wants you to be here. And there are probably some people here today that need to go out from here with that ringing in their ears. God wants you to be here. God wants you to exist. God loves you. God wanted you forever and ever to be a part of God's family. That's part of creating you. The predestination language. If you notice in this, in this passage, it's always predestined and chosen in Christ. 
There are different ways to interpret this. The one that I land on is that God predestined that whoever was in Christ would have amazing, powerful things because they've chosen to be part of God's family. I'm not particularly of the opinion that God decided whether I'm going to be in Christ or not. I had nothing to do with it. I think if you read this passage looking at the in Christ language, then he's saying, look, I'm going to create all these people. I love each one of them. I want them to exist. I'm going to give them the opportunity to become in Christ, which means they're in my family. But I'm not going to force that upon them. That's up to them. Do they want to be part of the family or not? And we get then this family metaphor that Paul uses again and again with God as the heavenly father and us as the children. We now get that. Like, I, I was invited by my parents to be a, an active part of the family and to be loved by them. But it was up to me. I could have said, the heck with you, you know, I'm going to wherever, Timbuktu, which actually is a real place, right? I could have really gone there and said, I don't want to be a part of your family at all. I had that ability. But they wanted me. So on the days that I wanted to be a part of the family, it went really well. When I was breaking that relationship, that went very badly, right? So you get that picture then of us and God. We're in God's story. And that's a beautiful, powerful, beautiful thing if we then receive that invitation to be in Christ. Let me read down through a summary of the things that are there for those who are in Christ, okay? In Christ, that means that now you're bought back by God. You're redeemed. Redeemed. Pawn shop. Got a bicycle. Need some money. Really nice bicycle. I go and I pawn it. They give me some money. Not everything that the bicycle's worth, probably. You know, maybe a little less than that, because they're probably going to sell it for a profit. And if I then want the bicycle back, can I get it back? Yeah, but I have to redeem it. I have to go buy it back, maybe pay some interest, that kind of stuff, and then I can have the bicycle back. The Bible's description of us is God creates us, God wants us to exist. We, at certain times in our life, just like our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, and so on and so forth, we at times have decided, eh, I don't really want to be part of God's family, or I don't really want to do what God wants me to do. When we do that, we basically are pawning ourselves into Satan's pawn shop. It's a catchy title. I don't know how many people would shop there, but you, you, you get what I'm talking about, right? We sell ourselves into slavery, into, into Satan's domain, and some of us have sold a lot of parts of ourselves. You know, our thinking, what we watch, what we do, how we use our money, how we treat people, how we act when we're angry, all these types of things. It's like, you know, it's like we pawn ourselves off into Satan's pawn shop, but God wants us back. God wants us back. God wants us in God's family. So the language in Ephesians and other places in the Bible is the one of redemption. God says, okay, I'm a community. I'm Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Son then will go and offer himself to sacrifice himself, pay for all the penalty, pay, make all the payment. And, and the interest rate is high, right? I mean, it's, it's very, very costly. We can't buy ourselves out of this, you know? Oh, I'll just do some good, and that's going to make up for what I did to that person. Nope, it doesn't work that way, because that person's still hurting. That, that sin is always going to be there. So Jesus pays the entire eternal penalty for us so that we can be able to be redeemed, bought back. That's in Christ. We're holy and blameless then. You're like, is Nathan holy and blameless in all that he does? And all God's people said, yeah. yeah. No, but... I want to be, and I want to always be in Christ. I do, I want that, even though I'll mess up. So God then looks at Jesus and then me. Looks at me through the lens of Jesus, which makes me blameless. Not because I'm personally blameless, but because Jesus is blameless. And I say, I want to be in Him. I want, I want Him to count for me. I want to be in God's family like that. We're adopted into God's, as God's children, into God's family. We have every spiritual blessing. We have forgiveness for sins. We have all wisdom, all understanding in terms of that which God has revealed in Jesus. Amazing. We're given the mystery of God's will. You're like, what is God's will? <laughs> I was just explaining it, right? You're, you're with me. God's will is to have us as God's family, to be redeemed back. And so then we have to accept that payment of Jesus was for us individually. I can't make that decision for you. Neither could your mama. Neither could whoever brought you in to be baptized, maybe as a little kid, right? 
Like, there comes a point at which God's like, okay, that counted for a while, but you got to decide, man. You got to decide. Do you want to be in that family? Because it's, it's beautiful, it's a blessing, but it also means that we accept the things that we can't change, which is God's the boss. <laughs> and, and God can tell me what to do, because God brought me into existence, and God can take me out of existence. Like, like, and God loves me, and God's more wise than me. Now we get back into the parent-child metaphor. We get that. There are times where I thought my parents were idiots, and then as I got into my 20s, I was like, wait, they learned a lot, right? Mark Twain, right? And he's talked about that. Wow, look how much they've learned. Well, no, I, I learned that there was some wisdom there. It, God's way more smart than our parents, way more. Loves us even more. So that which God wants for us, we're saying, I want that. That puts us in Christ. This is in Christ, the mystery. And so if we go back to the very last two verses there, 13 and 14, you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel, and that just means good news, that really good news, of your salvation. Salvation, another word for being redeemed from Satan's pawn shop into the family of God. Your salvation. You heard the message. You received it. Then he says, when you believed, remember, belief in Paul's language is like me saying, I believe that when I step on this step, it's going to hold me. I believe it. This is not belief. I believe it will hold me. Uh uh. That's, I think it would hold me. I believe it will hold me. I took the step, right? So you believe this whole message. You do something about it. You're believing it. You're living it out. Then you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. An ancient seal. Caesar. And over rules over the Roman Empire. Caesar has a seal. You, know, you take the wax, you put the seal in it, you seal a document with the, the ancient seal there. That document now is law, right? Like if you're, I mean, that, that means this is going to happen. And, and Caesar's going to use his whole army and stuff to make it happen. Right? So if, if God puts a seal on your heart, and it's the presence of the Holy Spirit saying, you are mine, I love you, I want to, to have you in my family forever, then God's going to do everything in God's power to make that happen. Way more important even than, than the seal of Caesar. In fact, when Paul used the word sonship, S-O-N, sonship, you're adopted as one of God's sons. I, I thought about using a translation that would just translate that away to children. So I was like, ah, I don't, you know, kind of sexism and stuff, I just, I, I don't, he's not getting at that. And then I realized, wait a second, I did some research. Paul intentionally used that word because legally, that word meant you were the eldest son, which meant you got the most inheritance. Now check this out. So Paul is saying that in the Roman Empire and throughout history before that, the oldest son got preferential treatment. But in God's family, all of us get preferential treatment. That's scandalous, man. There would have been people that read this and be like, you liberal hippie, and I'm throwing it out. You know, it's like, what? You know, no. It, the eldest son is always the most important. That's the way it's always been. It's the way it's always going to be. And God says, uh, no. You're all male, female, second born, third born, fourth born, does not matter. You're all adopted into the equal standing and have this amazing eternal inheritance. And God's like, I'm going to promise it. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit within you as a seal and as a guarantee. When you hear that, you start to believe it, and you start to live as though that's the case, your whole life is now the life of a son or daughter of God. You're changed. Now, you will still struggle and have problems. We'll find out at the end of the book of Ephesians. We're in chapter 1 right now, but in the end of the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, it says that we're struggling not against flesh and blood. So it's not the people that are the problem. It says there are spiritual forces of wickedness and rulers in this dark world. It's a spiritual battle. So when you wake up maybe tomorrow and you're, you're, you're struggling with this temptation or this bad feeling or this horrible thought and you're struggling with that, Paul would say, you're not struggling with your own flesh and blood anymore and you're not struggling with those people that are making you mad. You're struggling with supernatural forces that are trying to re-enslave you into Satan's pawn shop. 
And so at the end of Ephesians, if you'll stick with us for a few weeks here, we'll, we'll, we'll build on this whole idea that now that Holy Spirit of God helps us to do battle against those things that are tempting us and those, those problems that we have and, and everything that tries to drag us down or drag us away from the Lord. God's Holy Spirit helps us to do battle with that, not with, you know, the people that are seeming to be our enemies. No, 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 there's the spiritual realm spiritual realm and we were given strength and we can fight the battle well maybe even right now there's some battle that you're fighting you're sitting there going god i need some help i need that holy spirit to to, to not just give me the promise of eternal life and eternal inheritance i need help right now for me to fight this battle against whatever that's bothering you you know and so as we do a little bit of prayer here at the end i want us to first consider for yourself, am I in Christ? Am I in Christ? Am I, am I listening to this saying, I want to believe it. I want to follow it. I want to, I want to do that. You know, I want, to, I want this thing that was talked about 2,000 years ago and keeps on going right now and changing people's lives. I want to be in Christ. And that's a simple kind of prayer and decision. It's as simple as stepping onto the step. Right? It's as simple as just saying, God, I believe it. I want to live it. Forgive me and seal me with that Holy Spirit because of what Jesus did. Boom. That makes sense? Like, if not, we'll talk about it afterwards. Like, just corner me, right? I've got kind of like a little business meeting right after this, but it doesn't matter. Like, uh, we'll talk about this. This is way more important because the business meeting is celebrating that God's doing this stuff here. Like, it's amazing. It's really cool. Then, there may be other folks that say, I'm in Christ, but the battle is waging, and it is heavy, and it's tough. So I want to pray for you just generally on that. But then if you want to have special prayer afterwards, you can come forward. We can do that. We always have a prayer team up to the side. Um, or we can set up an appointment. We can talk. We can do some more intentional prayer. Because it is a real battle, but there are real weapons of the Spirit that help us with that. First, let's pray we're in Christ. Secondly, let's pray for help. God, for those that are right now starting to get it and starting to believe it, starting to, to at least say, I, I want to try that. I want to I want to believe that. Hear their prayer of God forgive me, redeem me, and please, through Jesus, give me that Holy Spirit. Put them in Christ. Right now. For those of us who say, uh, I've, I've been living out that decision, I, I believe it, I'm in Christ, but the battle is strong. And God, I pray that this church would have a fresh and powerful movement of your Holy Spirit to help us to live as your daughters and sons in victory over those things that come against us. Set us free from the evil spirits and all the, the, the evil that is around us that tries to drag us down. Set us free. And as we address different parts of our lives and want to be redeemed in those ways, give us strength and power and blow upon us your Holy Spirit right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.